ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر الا نفسه اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القران خلق الانسان علمه البيان رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين Today inshallah I'm going to talk about a very very basic topic which is the structure of the Quran. What is the structure of the Quran? <coughs> Before I talk about the structure of the Quran, some preliminary words about the subject. That is Quran according to the Quran is kalamullah. Can we do something about this? So Quran according to Quran is kalamullah hatta yasma'u kalamullah it is the word of Allah but not the word of Allah as human beings speak word we have a vocal cord we use our tongue and our teeth and we say words not kalamullah in the sense of like human beings speaking so so Kalamullah in the sense that it is the words of Allah. Now what is very interesting about that is, I have mentioned this a couple of times before, that human beings think in words, right? Just like a dog thinks and smells. Human beings think in words. And the largest area of the human brain is the speech center. So it makes sense that if you're communicating with human beings, you're going to communicate in words because that's how we think. So anyway, Quran is the kalam of Allah. It was revealed to Muhammad bin Abdullah where? Where, where was it revealed? Nazzala ala qalbika bi idnillah. It was revealed to the heart of the Prophet And the Quran came down in two phases, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. The basic structure of Quran, the basic unit, the smallest unit of the structure of Quran is called ayah. The word ayah means sign. And what's interesting is in philosophy there is a whole subject called semiotics which has to do with signs. <coughs> but before I talk about semiotics I want to talk about what is an ayah. The Quran does not work by giving sentences. There can be maybe one ayah that has 10 sentences like ayatul kursi is 10 sentences. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum la ta'khudhuhu sinatun wa la nawm lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard man dha alladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-idhni i'alamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yu'aytuna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bima sha'a wa siya kursi al-samawati wal-ard wa la yu'udhuhu hifdhuhuma wa huwa al-aliyun al-aliyun Ten sentences. One ayah, ten sentences. Sometimes one ayah can just be letters. Alif, la, mean. Or one Ayah can be one word. It's not a sentence. Ar-Rahman is one sentence. It's one ayah. It's not a sentence. So sometimes when we look at, you know, when we talk about, when you're trying to translate between Arabic to English, we usually say this verse, verse number 50, verse number 10. Verse gives the idea that each verse is a complete sentence. But this is not correct. Ayah is ayah. And there's no other word to replace really the meaning of the word ayah other than the word ayah itself. Every ayah is a sign of Allah's wisdom. Every ayah is. So Ar-Rahman, for example, the most compassionate, the intensely compassionate, is a sign of Allah's attributes, a sign of His wisdom, a sign from Him to us. Maybe in one sentence, there can be many different points. So each ayah is like one point to ponder upon. Each ayah is a sign to something else. What's interesting about semiotics 
is that I, oh, I made one point that the Quran is in words and human beings think in words. But the other point is that we never uh, think in terms of something in itself. We always think of something other than itself. Let me give you an example. If I show you keys, if I show you keys, you don't think a piece of iron. You think its function. It's, it's an iron. But you think, what does this point to its function? It po everything points to something else, which is how the human brain works. See, if you see a stop sign, you're not just looking at some shape. It's pointing to a certain idea that you have to stop when you see the stop sign, right? So everything is pointing to something else. And eventually everything is pointing towards Allah. And that's the idea of the ayah. Everything is pointing to or everything is a sign for of, Allah, of Allah's wisdom and ultimately everything is pointing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the basic structure of Quran is called ayah. The plural is ayat, the signs. Ayah also means symbol, it also means miracle. Every ayah is a miracle, right? Many ayahs we know what their miracles are. Like for example an ayah if it talks about the black hole, then we know, oh wow, this is a great miracle. How does Quran know, uh, how did Prophet Muhammad know about black holes 1,400 years ago? So, so for example, you know, in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, one of the great uh, parts, so I'm going to go over some parts of the Quran that talk about Quran too. But the basic structure of Quran in Quran is ayah, and in plural is ayat. When there's a collection, okay, when there is a collection of ayat, it makes a surah. Surah, the word surah means, you know when you have a fortress? When you have a fortress, you have a wall. The word surah means a wall. This is actually used in Surah Al-Hadid, then on the Day of Judgment, uh, there will be a wall that people that, that don't go into it, they're not in the mercy of Allah. That wall is called surah. Surah is, a wall, a fortress, you can say. You know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which the Prophet said, I am a city of knowledge, Ali is the door. This is a very uh, famous saying, even though there's a big dispute about its authenticity. But I'm not talking about its authenticity. I'm just making the point that ayah means a sign, and a whole surah is, the meaning of a surah is a wall. So each surah is like a city, is like a fortress of knowledge okay a city of knowledge you can say and the style of the surahs every surah the style is like a khutbah it's an oration even though we call it a book but the style of quran is oration and what happens in a khutbah or in an oration the beginning has to be very strong the ending has to be very strong and in the middle you mention your subject Okay, so the whole of Quran, every surah is like this. Every surah is strong. Beginning is very strong. You subbihu lillahi ma fil samawati wa ma fil ard. Alhamdulillahi alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yajal. Very grandeur opening. And a very grandeur closing. You know, huwa Allahu alladhi la ilaha illa hu alimu al-ghaybi wa al-shahadati wa al-rahmanu al-rahim. You know, till the end, right? Uh, Subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Or Surah you can look at Surah Yaseen, you can look at any of the surahs The beginning and the end are powerful, very grand And in the middle of it is the, the khutbah you can say is the points of the, the lecture that is And the other thing that needs to be kept in mind, every surah is independent in itself From any other surah But like I mentioned many times in this place Surahs, they also come in pairs, which if I have time, I'm going to talk about that in, in a second. So an ayah is the basic structure of Quran. A collection of ayat come together to make a surah. And the word surah means a fortress wall. Okay, Meaning every Quran is like a fortress. Nothing can come in, nothing can go out. It's, it's strong. And... The style of the Qur'an, the style of the surahs is like a khutbah, like a khutbah, okay? Now, the next thing that needs to be mentioned is the modes in which Qur'an came down in. There is 
two basic modes in which Quran came down. One mode is the Quran is with Allah where? This I also want to mention these two parts of the Quran very quickly before I go on to this particular topic. Ar Rahman wa Allam al Quran, the most compassionate, he taught Quran. Khalaq al Insan, he created man, his greatest creation. Allamahul Bayan, he taught him speech. The largest area of the brain is the speech center. What makes man different from animals? Other animals can see better, they can run more, they're stronger. But what it makes man man is his ability to communicate, his knowledge. So if you add the four ayat together, it is equal to Khayrukum man ta'allam al Qur'an wa allama. The best of you are those who learn Quran and teach Quran. Right? Quran is his greatest gift given to his greatest creation. And what is the best aspect of this creation is his ability to communicate and to think. Okay? Ar-Rahman allama al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan allama al The second point now I'm talking about the modes in which Qur'an came down with. The first mode is inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. Qur'an came down in laylatul qadr. But this has two modes. One is it's coming down from the seventh heaven from Ummul Kitab, the Quran calls it. Filohim Mahfuz. Filohim Mahfuz coming down to the first heaven, the lowest heaven. This universe as we know it, all the stars and all the galaxies and all the black holes and all the quasars and all of this, this is the, first, this is the last of this. So the Quran came from the highest heaven to the lowest heaven. This is called Anzal. This is one time. When something comes down in one go, this is called Anzal. So the Quran says in Surah Al-Waqi'ah فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ I swear by the places Allah says where the, Quran, where the stars they sink Waqa'a means to occur Waqa'a also means to sink Okay so Waqa'a The place where the stars they sink What happens when a star collapses? It becomes a black hole So فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ إِنَّهُ قَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ This is a great oath if you did but know. Because the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they did not know what a black hole was. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ إِنَّهُ قَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ This kitab maknun is the one that is with, the book that is with Allah. لَا يُمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَحَّرُونَ None can reach it except for the most purified. Meaning the angels are over there. They have access to that Quran, the original Quran. لا يمسوا إلا المطحرون تنزيل من رب العالمين. Then from the first heaven, from the last heaven, coming down in twenty-two years, give and take, twenty-two years, coming down little by little by little by little. This is تنزيل. So one is أنزال. We send down the Quran in one night. Called Laylatul Qadr. From the seventh heaven to the first heaven. Then from the first heaven, in 22 years, little by little by little by little, in 22 years, this makes the whole of the Quran. So these are the two basic modes in which the Quran came down in. Even in these two different modes, there are different aspects. For example, so the Qawthar came to the Prophet in a dream, for example. He woke up from a dream. And so sometimes what he came in the form of a dream, sometimes it came from Jibra'il, sometimes it was directly with Allah, like in the last ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. So it has different modes, you can say. But basically there are two modes. One is from the seventh heaven to the first heaven. And then from the first heaven to the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu But each time in whatever mode it was coming to the Prophet, whether it was in the form of a dream, or through an angel, or many angels, or it was directly with Allah, it was given to the Prophet ﷺ in his, what is Qur'an's terminology is, in his heart, in his heart. تَنزِيلٌ مِّ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Now over here, another point that needs to be made is about uh, one of the miraculous aspects of the Qur'an. Now imagine if you are like a, if you're the Prophet, if you're a poet, poet let's say, and you have to make 114 poems, right? So the, the, the 114 surahs. So I'm trying to say that a little bit was revealed and the Prophet had to remember 
Oh, this is part of Surah Al-Baqarah. And this, these ayat, they go with Surah Al-Imran. So every time revelation would come to the Prophet, he would dictate what came down to him. And the scribes, he had up to 50 scribes who would write down, who were Katab wahi the writers of Wahi, up to 50 used to write it down. And the Prophet used to say, these ayat, they go to this surah. And these ayat, they go to this surah. So as the ayat and the Qur'an were coming down, he would, he, the Qur'an was given to the Prophet without memorization. I'll come to this in a second. In fact, I'll, I'll t- tell you right now. The Qur'an says in Surah Al-Qiyamah, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به don't, O oh Muhammad, in, because when the Qur'an was coming down to the Prophet, he would want to quickly memorize the Qur'an. He would want to quickly memorize the Qur'an. So the Qur'an was telling the Prophet, this is not your responsibility. لَا تُحَرِّكْ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ It is on us to give this جَمْعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ It is on our part, it is our responsibility to gather this Qur'an in your heart and have you what? Recite it. Right? إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ قُرْآنَ فَإِذَا قَرَعْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ So when it is recited, you just follow it. Just follow it and automatically it will be in your memory. فَإِذَا قَرَعْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَ Then after that, we will also explain it to you. What, what is the meaning of these ayat? Like even for... Like for example, Alif Lam Mim, there is one riwayah, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam asked the Prophet, when he said Alif Lam Mim, he asked him, did you understand? And he said, yes, I understood. The Prophet understood. So it was on, the, on Allah to reveal it to the Prophet, to have him memorize it. This was all a miraculous pro- process. And then even though ayahs were coming down to the Prophet little by little by little by little, and as they were coming down, the Prophet would know, okay, this belongs to this surah. And this belongs to this surah. And these ayat, they belong to this surah. And you know, the, what is very important is to keep in mind the chronology that we have in the Qur'an. The, the Surah Al-Fatiha, then Baqarah, then Al Imran, like this. This chronology that we have in the Qur'an <coughs> is different from the chronology in which it was revealed to the Prophet for example, in in Quran, the way we have it, the first surah is Surah Al-Fatiha. But we all know the first surah that was revealed to the Prophet is Surah Al-Iqra, Surah Al-Alaq. The first five ayat, the first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq, right? Then after Surah Al-Alaq, it was the next, uh, maybe seven ayat of Surah Al-Mudassir, or the next few ayat of Surah Al-Nun, depending upon how you look at it. So you have Surah Al-Alaq, Surah Al-Nun, Surah al Muzammil and Surah Al-Mudassir, these are the first. And then after that, maybe Fatiha. Okay? There are some surahs that were revealed completely in one go. One revelation came and the whole surah came. Like in the case of Surah Al-Kawthar, like in the case of Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha was the first surah revealed to the Prophet. The whole surah was revealed and it was the first surah in which the whole, the entire surah was revealed. So in that sense, in that sense, from this riwayah of Ali radiallahu anh, Surah Al-Fatiha was the first complete surah given to the Prophet And we can understand this logically because one of the first things the Prophet had to do was to pray. So Fatiha was necessary for that, right? So there is the revelation, the chronology of the revelation of the Prophet as it was being revealed to him slowly and slowly. And as it was being revealed to him, let's say five ayat here, ten ayat there, seven ayat there, as different events were coming, ayat were coming down, and the Prophet was dictating it and saying, okay, these ay- these verses that came down to me, they belong to this surah. They belong to this chapter. So he had to keep this all in his mind. Then every Ramadan, what would the Prophet do after a while when he started doing every Ramadan? When he was in Medina, he would start reciting the whole of the Qur'an as it been, had been revealed to him in the chronology that would be in the book as we have it in the Mus'haf today. So he would start reciting the Qur'an every Ramadan, you know the hadith of the Prophet, that's, I believe in Sahih Bukhari, that I would review the whole of the Qur'an with Jibra'il every Ramadan. But the last year in which the Prophet was going to depart, he reviewed the whole of the Qur'an with Jibra'il twice, right? So the point is, 
the chronology and what was being revealed to him. But then the miraculous aspect of that is he had to remember. And no human being can remember, oh, with 6,660 ayahs, how can you remember, oh, these are, this is part of this surah and this is part of this surah and it's coming little by little, it's, right? It's coming little by little. You can remember for 114 surahs where each ayah is going where and you read it as a whole book at the end as one without making a mistake and somebody saying in the process, oh, but Prophet, you dictated these ayahs to me in this surah and now you're reading that, those ayahs with another surah. It never happened. Because it was in his mind as it should have been. As I said, the Prophet ﷺ, he was dictating to his companions as the revelations were coming down. But over here, I want to mention something important about the, the authenticity and the collection of Qur'an. The authenticity and the collection of Qur'an also had two phases. One is, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the Prophet was indicated and told to write down the Qur'an. The first command. For example, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِنْ قَلَمْ So, the oration ikra is the recitation. So, this is one form and mode of learning. And the other one was عَلَّمَ بِنْ قَلَمْ So, the Qur'an was being written down from the very early days. I mean, this idea that, oh, later the companions, they were hufaz, and this is not completely the whole picture. The Prophet was told the importance of the pen from the very beginning. The second surah, or the third surah, revealed to the Prophet ﷺ was Sutul Qalam or Sutul Noon. What is it? Noon wal Qalami wa ma? Yes. By the pen and by what they're writing. And what is Allah swearing about? Many of the Mufassirin say Allah is swearing about the writing of the Quran from the very beginning. We know the very famous story of Umar bin Khattab becoming Muslim, right? How did he become Muslim when he was at his sister's house? What was he? Did he hear the Qur'an or did he read the Qur'an? He read the Qur'an. So from the very beginning, the writing, the process of, the oral tradition was there of recitation. The oral tradition of recitation was there, but the tradition of writing was also there from the very, very beginning. Okay? And what's interesting is, you have from the Qur'an from the very beginning its process of preservation. And today, as few as, as maybe just two, three years ago, I even gave a khutbah on this when this happened, but in Birmingham, they, uh, they found manuscripts from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, different surahs, about I think one and a half Jews worth. Surahs, uh, they found original manuscripts that carbon date to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And then, so, the Qur'an from the very beginning said, عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمِ Taught by the pen, so it was written down from the very beginning. نُونْ وَالْقَلَمِ وَمَا يَسْطُرُونَ And then what happened? After that, again, it went through two different phases. <coughs> when the Prophet had passed away, and Umar had made the ijtihad that we should put the Qur'an in the form of a book in the form of what he, the word he used was not book, he used the word mushar a bound book, right? has a hard cover in the beginning, hard cover in the middle in, in the end, sorry and a bound book, we should put the Qur'an in the form of a bound book when he had this opinion, how did they do it? you remember those scribes that I told you? so one was the oral tradition, the people that had memorized the Qur'an but then there were people that had taken direct dictation from the Prophet. And how did the Prophet dictate to the people? This is also important. The Prophet would say, these ayat have been revealed to me. Write this down. And then he would read the ayat that were, recite, that were revealed to him. They would write down the ayat given to him. Then he would have the scribes read back to him what he had what just recited to them. And so this process was there in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And many times there are indications in the, in the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ that many times the Prophet was doing this even as Juma khutbah. Like he would go an entire, like Sutul Qaf for example, it is mentioned, the, the one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, she says, I learned the whole Sutul Qaf in the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning he was teaching the surahs in his khutbah. This is one of the things he was doing. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, 
is that Abu Bakr took this, the people who had written down the Quran, who had taken dictation from the Prophet وسلم, on the Quran, he took them, gathered them together, and got two to four witnesses, two to four witnesses for each and every ayah. Yes, this ayah is first. This ayah is second, this ayah is third, this is the first surah, this is the second surah, this is the third surah. And he got, he asked for every single ayah, okay, who wrote down this, which scribe wrote down these ayah, bring me your scrolls. Bring me what you, where you wrote it down. And it wasn't enough to say to a Hafiz, is this right? No, Hafiz were part, not part of this process as such. He, Abu Bakr only used the people who had what? Written down and they would testify, yes. This person says this ayah is here at this point in Quran. This is the ayah before it. This is the ayah after it. And this way, this whole process was used to collect the Quran. And this is what Abu Bakr did in his lifetime. He did this process. But then, as Islam was spreading, people were, even though everyone, this Mus'haf that was with now in the house of one of the wives of the Prophet, this was this book that was collected was there but people were still writing Quran on their own and sometimes people would have a difference of opinion on the spelling of words like Musaytif is it going to be with Seen or Saad even though it's going to sound like even if it's Seen it sounds like Saad so Musaytif or some of the other words like this there was some difference of opinion on how to spell the words the difference of opinion was on how to what? Spell the words. You can say, Jamiul Quran in its real sense, meaning was the Prophet himself. But then uh, the collection of the Mus'haf was done by Abu Bakr. But the collecting of people on one spelling, standard spelling for all the words in the Quran, standard spelling of how to write the words, this was done by Uthman radiallahu anhu. This was done by Uthman radiallahu anh. So Uthman radiallahu anh, uh, time is running out, so I have to give my a second khutbah. Uthman radiallahu anh gathered the people ala rasmul wahid, one type of spelling for all of the words of the Quran. And so this is, the, then he made copies of this, and this went to Tashka and then different places of the world. We have one copy even today, or I think we have two copies today of that original writings uh, that Uthman uh, had, had a copy of. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم ولي سائر المسلمين والمسلمات إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد رسول الله ورسول Please come forward. Please make space. Uh, very quickly, I want to end, uh, inshallah, I, I didn't really finish everything I wanted to say. Uh, one point that I will make very quickly uh, before I talk about the final topic that I actually want to talk about is the difference between Makki and Madani surahs. Makki surahs are all the surahs revealed to the Prophet in Makkah or while he was in the Makki phase. Even if he was going to Ta'if, even if he went outside Makkah or around Makkah, <coughs> But while he was in the Makki phase before Hijrah, anywhere he was before Hijrah is called Makki Quran. Anywhere he was after the Hijrah is called Madani Quran, even if he wasn't in Medina. As you know, the Prophet was going to battles. Sometimes he was in Ohad, sometimes he was in Badr, sometimes he was in Tabuk, sometimes he was in near Syria. You know, so the Prophet, no matter where he was traveling, the division of Quran is based upon before Hijrah or after Hijrah. No matter where he was, before Hijrah is Makki Qur'an, no matter where he was after Hijrah is called Madani Qur'an. Now, so uh, I just want to, before I finish, because again, I didn't really finish the topic I wanted to, but I want to end by mentioning this, it's very important, and that is, what are the five obligations Muslims owe to Qur'an? <coughs> Number one, and everyone should leave here knowing these five obligations you owe to, owe to Qur'an. Number one obligation is to believe in Qur'an. Number one obligation is to believe in Qur'an. This is Kalamullah, revealed upon the heart of the Prophet. Its original is with Allah, and we have copies of it. Okay? You can say we have attested copies of it. 
verified copies of that Quran. Ummul ladayya fi kitab maknun la yumasu illa al mutahharun. Number two, obligation of a Muslim is to read Quran. You have to read Quran, right? The first ibadah given to the Prophet was what ikra. First ibadah, first worshiping of Allah. Reading Quran is ibadah, and reading Quran is learning. So Quran is an ibadah. Reading qira, reading Quran in its proper recitation in its proper form is a form of ibadah. Okay, so ikra was the first ibadah given to the Prophet sallallahu It's Excellence is in salah when you're standing in prayer before Allah, then reading Him. This is in its you can say its excellent form. So anyway, number two obligation: first is to believe in Quran, <coughs> second is to read Quran, third is to act upon, or the third you can say is to understand Quran. Third is to what? Understand. Understand Quran. You have to know for that what is an ayah, what is a surah, how surahs come together, how they're interrelated, what is the message of Qur'an, what is the guidance of Qur'an, and then to read it over and over again, to do dhikr, in nahnu nazzalna dhikr, az zikr is Qur'an, az zikr, the zikr, the remembrance, and you have to pound this into your personality, because it won't, it has to get absorbed into your person. the word of Allah has to get absorbed, you know, uh, keep reading pound this Quran into your being until it becomes part of your thinking process this is why Quran is in words so number three is to understand Quran number four is to very important act upon Quran no use believing in it reading it, understanding it, if you're not going to act upon it. Very, very hard. Very, 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 very hard to act upon Quran. May Allah give us the topic to act upon Quran. So, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us love of the Quran. Understanding.